Hello, and welcome to a lecture on single stub matching. I'm Steve Ellingson. A popular way to implement narrowband and beans matching on printed circuit boards is single stub matching using structures consisting entirely of microstrip transmission lines. Now, this isn't the only way to do it, but it is a very popular way and one well worth learning. So first, a quick reminder about transmission line impedances. We'll need to know those equations in order to do this. Then I'll show you the single stub matching technique. Then a example to demonstrate the technique. Then finally a summary. So first, the input impedance of a transmission line. We have probably covered this in a previous lecture and you have probably seen it in a previous course, but just to remind you of the notation and the equations I'm going to be using. We have a transmission line having a characteristic impedance of Z sub C. It's terminated into a load, which is simply a terminating impedance, Z sub L. The length of the transmission line is L. And the question is, what is the input impedance? And the input impedance is given by this equation, which is, of course, a function of the characteristic impedance, uh, the length, the wavelength in the transmission line and this parameter gamma and gamma is the reflection coefficient looking this way. So it is Z sub L minus Z sub C, Z sub L plus Z sub C. And then also to remind you about admittance. Admittance is the reciprocal of it, impedance. It is uh, more useful in some cases than impedance including the single stub matching technique. It's more easily done in terms of admittance than impedance. So it's very simple to go back and forth. Admittance is simply the reciprocal of impedance. So the characteristic admittance is the reciprocal of the characteristic impedance. And just a notation note here, uh, we often write the admittance in terms of a real part, G, and an imaginary part, B, just as we write impedance sometimes as R plus JX. So this is simply notation, uh, G being the real part of admittance, B being the imaginary part of admittance. Now special cases that are going to turn out to be important here are open circuited and short circuited stubs. Those are uh, stubs in which the terminations uh, are either infinite impedance or zero impedance, respectively. So for an open circuited stub, uh, we have already found, and you can find by simple substitution in the previous equation, that the input impedance is given by minus j, the characteristic impedance, times this cotangent function, which varies as the electrical length, that is L over lambda. And we can write that in terms of admittance as well. Minus J becomes plus J, characteristic impedance becomes characteristic admittance. We have a tangent instead of cotangent. And for the short circuited stub, which will also be of interest, the input impedance is given by this expression. And similarly, the admittance is given by the reciprocal of that expression. So these are handy formulas to, uh, uh, to keep uh, in mind because we use them all the time in single stub matching. Okay, next, the input impedance of a single stub structure. Let's explain what we mean by that. Well, here we have a terminating impedance Z sub L, a transmission line with a characteristic impedance Z sub C1. I'm using now the subscript 1 because we have multiple transmission lines involved and I want to keep them straight. So this is the characteristic impedance of this transmission line, which has a length L1. And sometimes I'll refer to this as the primary line. Now attached to that, at the input, is a parallel section of line, which is either short-circuited or open-circuited. Now this transmission line may or may not be of the same characteristic impedance, so I'll identify that as Z C sub 2. Although I'll tell you now that 99 times out of 100, we will make these two impedances the same, uh, but that's not necessarily uh, required. The length of this transmission line is L sub 2, 
and we refer to this as the stub. So this is a stub in parallel with some primary line. And the question is, what is the input impedance now? Well, the input impedance is simply the parallel combination of the impedance of the primary line and the impedance of the stub. So Z1, which is the impedance looking this way, that is the input impedance of the primary line, in parallel with Z stub, which is the input impedance looking this way. The input admittance is simply Y1, that's the reciprocal of Z1, plus Y stub. Now, the reason we like admittances here should be obvious. This is a simple addition of admittances, whereas to compute the input impedance, we have to compute the parallel combination. That's a much more complicated expression, especially since all these parameters uh, are complex valued. Now we can write this in terms of real and imaginary parts of admittance, which case we get y sub 1, that's just g sub 1 plus j b sub 1, and then the admittance of a stub, which is entirely imaginary valued, so we can write this as j b sub stub. And that's because g sub stub is 0. Uh, the real part of the admittance is 0 for a stub that's open-circuited or short-circuited. And I can gather up the terms here so that the total input admittance is equal to G sub 1, that's the real part of the admittance of the primary line, plus the susceptances, as we say, of the primary line and the stub. In other words, uh, the sum of the imaginary parts of the admittances of the primary line and the stub. So this is now the expression for the input admittance of the single stub structure that we've drawn here. Now matching. Well, I've rewritten this expression for the admittance of the single stub uh, structure. The procedure is this, and this is the single most important slide in the lecture because it gives the technique. The idea is to use L1 and Z sub C1 to match G1, that is the real part of the admittance of the primary line, to G sub N, which is the real part of the admittance that we seek. Now this gets the real parts of the admittance matched up. Then we use L sub 2 and Z sub C2 to match B1 plus B stub to B in. So this will tell us what B stub should be. So let me show you an example. In this example, we have a primary line, length L1. I'm now specifying the load impedance, Z sub L equals 5.1 plus J 7.5 ohms, looking in the indicated direction. And the task at hand is to use this structure to convert the impedance to 50 ohms real. So this is a very, very common type of problem, very typical numbers. Uh, a classic application of this particular kind of design is for the input matching networks and output matching networks of RF transistors, although there are many other uh, applications. And this could easily be the desired impedance uh, for one of these structures. And 50 ohms is a very typical input and output impedance that's been specified for an amplifier. In any event, we are going to do this for a frequency of 2 gigahertz. Recall this is a narrow band technique in the sense that we have to select a nominal design frequency. We'll choose to do this on FR4. If you recall FR4 means uh, the relative permittivity is about 4.5 and the height is uh, also specified. Now we have to decide on the characteristic impedance of the transmission lines. It is very common simply to set the characteristic impedance of both transmission lines equal to the real valued desired impedance, which in this case is 50 ohms. So we'll call all of those things Z0, Z sub 0, uh, that is 50 ohms. Now note here, Z sub naught does not mean reference impedance. Uh, 
In previous lectures, we may have used the variable z sub naught to mean reference impedance, that is, the impedance for which s parameters are computed. Here, we mean simply z naught as being the characteristic impedance of these transmission lines. Now, is that a little bit uh, goofy? Yes, it totally is. Uh, sometimes we use z sub naught to represent a characteristic impedance, sometimes we use it to represent reference impedance, and sometimes those two things are the same. They frequently are. However, just don't lose track of the fact that this can mean different things and it may or may not be the reference impedance. So enough said about that. Now this problem has been completely specified. We've decided to use 50 ohm transmission lines. We're going to match this complex valued impedance to this real valued impedance and we're ready to go. So the first step is to figure out what the input admittance that we seek is and it is simply 0 0.02 mohs, mohs being reciprocal ohms. That's just 1 over 50. So the real part of the admittance is 0 0.02 mohs, and the imaginary part is 0. It will also be useful to know the wavelength. We'll have to know that at some point. Since this is FR4, and given the relative permittivity and knowing the effective relative permittivity, which I believe I've discussed in a previous lecture, we can compute the wavelength in the transmission line. I showed you previously that it was about 0.6 uh, times the free space wavelength. So that's 0.6 times the speed of light divided by frequency. And you should find that that is 90.4 millimeters. 90.4 millimeters then is the wavelength in the transmission line at 2 gigahertz. And we're going to need this reflection coefficient gamma that is looking this way from the transmission line into the load. That's easily computed using the equation I gave previously and you find that that's minus 0 0.782 plus J 0 0.242. So we've got that ready to go. So now I've written down the wavelength here, I've written down the reflection coefficient, we're ready to go. The first thing is to match up the real parts of the admittance. G1, which again is looking into the primary line this way, is the real part of the reciprocal impedance looking in that direction. Right? Admittance is the reciprocal of impedance. G1 is the real part of admittance. So G1 is the real part of the reciprocal of Z1. And we know Z1, we've got an expression for that, which I showed you in one of the very first slides in this lecture. I'm simply writing it here. So what I want is for this value to be equal to this value. In other words, I want this whole equation to be equal to 0 0.02 mohs. Now I'll tell you that that happens when the line is 0 0.024 wavelengths. Now, how did I get that? All I did is I wrote a two-line script in MATLAB, which computes this for various values of L1, starting from a very short length, like 0 0.001 wavelengths. And you will quickly find that you, with a quick manual search, you will find that this is the value, at least to three digits, that gives you uh, 0.02 mohs to a close approximation. Now there are other ways to do this. The way you may have learned to do this in a previous course is with a Smith chart. If you are more comfortable with that technique or you uh, for some reason prefer it, by all means use a Smith chart. Uh, using a Smith chart you are essentially doing a graphical solution to this equation. In any event, I get that the primary line must be 0 0.024 wavelengths. Okay, so now I've written that up here since we know that. I know that Y1, again the admittance looking into the primary line, is now 0 0.0202. Now I've plugged in the exact value because I did a numerical search, right, and I chose a line length. So now I plugged that line length back into the expression for admittance and got the actual value out. That will improve the accuracy of my solution here.
And I find the imaginary part when I do that, that's left over, is minus j 0 0.0573 mos. So now the task at hand is to get rid of this part. And the way to do that is to use the parameters we have left unconstrained, namely the choice of stub length as well as how it's terminated. So basically we want the shortest length, because there are multiple lengths that will work here, that will eliminate this when I combine the stub in parallel with the primary line. So we consider both possibilities and find the shortest stub that does the job. For an open circuited stub, here's the expression. So substituting values here, this equation then requires plus j 0.573 mos to equal plus j 0.02 mos times the tangent of 2 pi L2 over lambda, and L2 is what I have to find. That's simply enough done. I find that L2 is 0.197 wavelengths. That is 17.7 millimeters. The other possibilities, I can use a short-circuited stub. For a short-circuited stub, the stub admittance is given by this expression. When I substitute values, I get this equation. And once again, I want to solve for L2. When I solve for L2, I find the smallest value that satisfies that equation is 0.447 wavelengths, which is 40.2 millimeters. So the open circuited stub wins in this case because this is shorter and it meets the requirements. Now one side note here, every once in a while somebody will work a problem like this and offer a value of L2 which is negative. And that's obviously not physically possible. So uh, you can find solutions to these equations for L2 being negative, but they don't physically mean anything because the line length can't be negative. So there you simply need to increase L2 until you get to the first positive value that solves the equation. So enough said on that. In any event, here is the completed design. 50 ohms on this side, 5.1 plus J 7.5 ohms looking in the indicated direction. This line length is 17.7 millimeters. This line length is 2.2 millimeters. This is on FR4, has a relative permittivity of 4.5 and an H height that is of 1.575 millimeters. Microstrip width is three millimeters. Uh, you should know this from a previous lecture where we worked out the required width in FR4 to achieve a specified characteristic impedance. So three millimeters in FR4 gives us about 50 ohms. That's where that came from. And of course, all this has been worked out for two gigahertz. Just for comparison here, I'm showing a quarter, a US uh, 25 cent piece, which is about 24 millimeters across. So for scale here, you can see that this uh, matching structure is quite compact. Uh, it would certainly fit inside the uh, footprint of a quarter. So here's a summary of single stub matching. The procedure goes like this. You switch from impedances to admittances. You use the length of the primary line, not the stub, that's a common error. You first use the length of the primary line to match the real part of the admittance. And then you use the length of the stub to match the imaginary part of the resulting admittance. Now you do this twice, once for an open circuited termination or short circuit determination and you select the one that results in the shortest stub because you almost always, in fact probably always, want the sh most compact possible uh, device. And then as I pointed out the Smith chart graphical solution is an excellent way to visualize this process and you, work, you can work the whole problem using Smith charts. Uh, no problem to do that. But I point out here that a manual numerical search is fine too. Uh, I gave you the equation to do that. It's quite simple to do this in just a few lines of MATLAB. This concludes this lecture on single stub matching.